Hello, and welcome to Pitt Street Research. My name is Stuart Roberts, and I'm one of the co-founders of our firm. And joining me from Perth on the afternoon of Tuesday, the 9th of September, 2024, is Mr. Michael Walsh, who's the CEO of MTM Critical Metals, ASX MTM. Michael, good afternoon. Hi, Stuart. Thanks for having me. So, Michael, you've uh, recently got hold of some technology from Rice University in Texas that allows you to do flash dual heating. Um, now, we all know the name Jewel if we pay attention at chemistry in, in, in school. He was the guy who figured out you run uh, electrical current through uh, a conductor, and if the resistance is high enough, you get heat. Well, you've put that technology effectively on steroids. Uh, your version of flash dual heating, you can heat up a substance to over 3,000 degrees Celsius in less than a second. How in the heck did you and your colleagues at Rice achieve that? Yeah, it's all come up the research of Dr. James Tour. Uh, people might be familiar with him. He He's also behind uh, the Weebit Nano success story, which was born in Rice University and licensed into a, an ASX shell back in 2016. And that's that's got up over like one and a half billion market cap. So he's very credible. He's been nominated for chemist of the year uh, and these type of accolades. And so very high caliber team. The researchers there were looking at the, the, what they first were looking at was creating graphene from waste tires. And they realized that if you ultra fast heat the waste tire material, you form this very beautiful, perfectly formed graphene. And that was the first commercial application of this technology to an industrial problem. And that company is, is a private company now called Universal Matter, and they're based in Toronto. And they've already scaled this up to one ton per day. And then MTM came off the back of that, and they've acquired the rights to all other minerals, metals, and ores, except for those related to graphene manufacturing. So we've got potentially a much, much bigger market scope than the graphene potential. And so the, the Rice guys have licensed that technology globally, worldwide, exclusively to MTM. And I've looked at some of the, uh, the literature that's, that's out there. Um, it's a paper from a couple of years ago um, that shows that uh, in an early version of the technology, uh, you could get very good yields of various rare earths and other metals from fly ash, of all things, the waste product from um, from burning coal in, in coal-fired power stations. Um, that was then, this is now. Uh, more recently, you've got a technology that's uh, that's been considerably scaled up and has even higher yields than that. Yeah, so the, the original concept was to get waste dumps like coal fly ash or red mud where like red mud globally there's there's over a billion tons of red mud sitting in deposits around the world and there's this is probably the, a similar a waste from bauxite processing yes that red mud is from bauxite processing and coal fly ash is the stuff that's left over once you combust coal <clears throat> so it's the stuff that doesn't turn into carbon dioxide and water everything else is basically called ash and that ash will normally contain various metals like rare earths, scandium, gallium even in, in some instances, um, because it's essentially coal was originally part of some mineral, you know, eons ago. So the, it, it is possible to recover rare earths out of them. But the issue with coal fly ash is, or red mud is similar, that the, the metals that you're after are quite tightly bound and they're refractory. The technical jargon is refractory. And it's not feasible currently by other methods like pyrometallurgy or hydrometallurgy to economically pull out those metals. Whereas Dr. Tour found that if you just flat it for a few seconds, the refractoriness goes away and you can then pull out the target metals using very benign acids. That was the original proposition. And then um, a couple of months, maybe over a year ago, we started looking at mineral processing, so getting the likes of spodumene, which is the main ore source of lithium globally. we It's right available here in our backyard in West Australia. So we got some spodumene and see, the, the initial concept was to see, can we compete with the current incumbent steps, which it's called calcination, where you, you basically bake the spodumene concentrate at three hours 1100 degrees in a big rotary kiln and that the purpose of that is just to allow the spodumene to expand if you don't do that you can never pull out the lithium from it no matter what strength of acid you use so th this calcination step is a well-known problem for the lithium industry it's very co2 intensive very 
the, the flow sheet itself is very reagent intensive. And our original proposition was to see if we can just compete and better that calcination step. And we, we achieved that. We, we can do in a few minutes what the current calcination step does in three hours. So there's potentially, you know, over 50% of the energy required saved just for that step. And then we've also made a, a more recent innovation and doing that same flashing or calcining, but doing it in a chlorine atmosphere. And what we found is quite miraculous that you, you form lithium chloride directly from spodumene concentrate. And wh why is that important? Well, you, you go to a direct sale of a product in just one step. And there's then in theory, just one more step to turn that into a battery grade lithium carbonate. So the current flow sheet is this big, complicated, multi-step, high OPEX, high reagent usage, high energy usage, um, very problematic uh, process. And just have to Google what's happened here in the Kemerton project in Western Australia. Uh, it's it's It was over a billion dollars just to build one train of a, of a four train uh, refinery. And they, they mothballed trains two and three and four, they have never achieved nameplate capacity because all of the expertise for that particular flow sheet resides in China. And they had serious issues getting technical people here in Western Australia who knew how to do lithium refining. And uh, so it's a long story short, it's a very convoluted, complicated, but nasty process. And, and you've just upended all of that by ca effectively cutting out half the process from spodumene through to uh, battery grade uh, material. Yeah. It's over half, actually, if you just do it on a unit operation, it's, it's over like 80% of the current steps in the flow sheet could be, in theory, eliminated. Um, and you, you go from spodumene concentrate to a, a direct sale of a product. Instead of, say, 50 steps, you go in essentially one step. Right. So, yeah, that's why we're quite excited. And we, we are talking to big industry players to hopefully collaborate at some point. And we can't announce who they are, but... We've got lots of interest from big, big players in the industry who uh, were quite, uh, I suppose, intrigued by this technology and what we've managed to do. Well, no surprises there. You, we, we, as we speak, uh, uh, lithium carbonate is changing hands at, at about uh, ten or eleven thousand dollars US a ton. Uh, it and it did, it did reach more, much higher than that in the, the previous lithium frenzy. It, I think lithium hydroxide got over eighty thousand dollars a ton. Right. And I think. The market's very volatile because it's 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 a very, I suppose, nascent market, and they there's no real futures market that can give you any kind of certainty as to what the the next couple of months pricing is going to be. So it's I think it's it's going to be this boom bust cycle. So there will undoubtedly be another lithium price boom at some point in the in the future, I would imagine. Right. But there's a lot of uneconomic lithium projects out there now that potentially could become economic if if you can dramatically reduce capex and opex perhaps. Right. And that is just one application of uh, the um, uh, flash dual heating technology, which has come out of uh, Rice University. We, we talked before about extracting, amongst other things, rare earth elements out of uh, fly ash, for example. The world's desperate for new sources of, uh, of, of uh, rare earths that are not under the control of the of the current Chinese virtual monopoly of the well, not virtual monopoly, but close enough to it. Uh, yeah. Dominance, shall we say, of the of the uh, rare earth space. Um, uh, there's there's a, a whole lot of other metals, uh, such as uh, uh, nickel and cobalt, that we can extract from various waste sources as well. So the, the opportunity is a lesion. Um, what's the opportunity for you in terms of, now that we, we're up, we're, we're producing uh, at uh, uh, kilograms of the stuff through the pile plants, and we've talked about a one tonne a day uh, uh, pilot for the graphene opportunity, which another company is working on. How long until we have a one tonne per day pilot plant at MTM working on, on the technology you've licensed? So the, the current schedule is our engineering partner, Nighthawk, they're, they're based in Texas. They're a well-established engineering company. Their mandate is to give us a finalized design by the end of this year with hopefully then allowing us to start construction in Q1 next year and essentially be up and running by the end of Q2 next year. So that's commissioning completed and we're actually processing material by the end of Q2. That's uh, quite an optimistic and aggressive schedule, but that, that's our current ambitions. Right. So um, this technology has pretty much gone from um, um, uh, ground zero in, in 2020 to the point where we're talking about a seriously uh, scaled uh, uh, pilot plant. 
Um, what are the commercials like? Uh, let's say a, a mining company comes along and says, we've got uh, this, this spodumene deposit and we want to process it uh, cheaply. How did the economics work? Uh, I suppose we we haven't knotted out the exact business arrangements with each of the different parties because there are several ways we could go about it. There, there'll be potential joint ventures where we might get uh, a share in the metal value of the, on the outset and also get paid a processing fee of the incoming feed or we might own certain deposits ourselves and aim to sell the material directly into the market ourselves for, for different applications like gallium from gallium scrap, for example, or gold recovery from e-waste, for example. So I think each vertical that we're going after, like gold from e-waste or gallium, will have its own unique business model. I think the, uh, like, for example, the gallium opportunity, a one ton per day unit is actually a commercial scale proposition for gallium because in the US, for example, the total consumption of gallium metal is about, I think, 500 tons per annum. And there's a lot of US defense contractors that use gallium and they're 100% reliant on China for that gallium. So there's actually grants available from the Department of Energy that we're actively pursuing right now, specifically for building a demo plant for gallium extraction, for example. So we don't necessarily need to get to huge scales for a commercial outcome. So gallium could be commercial, we hope, in the next year, and potentially e-waste as well. For lithium, to get to a commercial scale unit, I think we'll have to get to at least 20 tonnes per hour. That's the figure that I'm currently aiming for in my head. But I think a demo plant to one of the bigger players will hopefully allow us to move to that next step with the lithium player, for example, who co-funds that pilot plant, right. allowing us to build it at their one of their sites and we kind of jointly own the economics of the outcome. So there, it, it, I know it sounds complicated, but I think we'll easily get a gallium or e-waste business model up and going quite quickly. And we hope that's going to happen in the next 12 months. And we, it's very hard to predict how the other, like the lithium or the rare earth discussions go um, dealing with, you know, these big multinational companies. Now, most investors in Australia won't know who you are. Um, Michael, you, you, um, you're you from Ireland originally, as people can tell from your accent. Uh, uh, Bachelor of Engineering in, um, in Chemical Engineering from uh, University College Dublin. A lot of your career was spent with a Finnish company, um, originally out of tech. Uh, merged with another company called Metso. Um, what kind of experience did you get in, in that role, which you, you've now brought into this very much smaller company? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the, the, yeah, the Metso, they're now like the world's biggest technology provider for metals and mining refining. So they've got every single technology you can think of, all the way from smelters to um, like flotation cells to grinding mills, everything that you need to turn your ore into a, a metal product. So I spent about 10 years with those guys in various different hats and um, more in more later years in kind of senior management roles. But I suppose principally it was often taking technology from small scale and convincing a big miner like BHP or Newcrest or Newmont to be the first to implement that technology at one of their sites and uh, allow us to then actively commercialize the product and sell it to other people. So it was, a lot of scale up of mineral processing and a lot of flow sheet development for different clients, a lot in the lithium space. So probably worked on all the lithium projects in uh, Asia Pacific and in terms of understanding their flow sheets and their equipment needs. The same story for rare arts, pretty much worked on most of the rare art projects in Australia in a technical and commercial capacity and, and various other gold, nickel, you name it. So you have to be involved in every single kind of commodity opportunity that's available in your market area. My market area was was Asia Pacific, so Australia and all of Southeast Asia. And um, you've jumped from that into a, a market cap of $15 million roughly uh, company. You must have seen a lot of upside in uh, in flash fuel heating. Yeah, look, um, I was attracted by the more entrepreneurial side of things and the, I suppose, the ability to more control your own destiny rather than being in this big corporate conglomerate. And also, like what attracted me to the flash dual heating was I originally was a technology advisor to MTM and I suggested that they test spodumene. And once I saw the benefits and the potential for spodumene, that's what convinced me that 
hey, there's real meat on the bone here. And another thing that convinced me was when I visited that universal matter graphene plant and the fact that they've already done the hard lifting to get to one ton per day, that gave me a lot of comfort that this isn't just some flash in the pan, crazy academic idea from some university. It's It's got real legs. And the fact that Dr. Tour is such a world-renowned scientist and he's already had big success on the ASX a wee bit. And right. then, and, and, and we're not this... We're not just a single company on the ASX with no peers. We've got some peers like Iperion X, who we will try and emulate. They, they've got a very similar story. They they acquired a they were essentially a shell company with some exploration grant, and they acquired a technology from Utah University. From it's a mineral processing uh, technique to recover titanium from scrap, and they, they've now got a huge valuation. I think seven eight hundred million. So, and they've also had some involvement from the likes of the Department of Energy in the U.S. and grant funding from the U.S., all of which we are, we are also actively seeking. So we're, we're trying to re-rate MTM. And given the quick success we've had with lithium and the interest we've had from the bigger players, I think uh, yeah, it was a wise decision to to leave the the big corporate world of um, where I was and, and get something more entrepreneurially going like this. But look, I've, I've dealt with all the players that we're engaging with to date – all these big names that we're trying to collaborate with, um, I've had to deal with them all in a previous life, so I know exactly how they, how they, those beasts tend to operate, and I think we can definitely get a lot of action going with with several of the, of them. Right. Well, Michael Walsh, well done on what you've achieved in the very short time you've been at, at, at MTM. We're starting to get some pretty good um, uh, uh, data coming out of the laboratory, soon to come out of the uh, the, the the pilot plant. And a year from now, possibly, we're, we're talking about uh, significant scale-up again. So keep up the good work. Thanks very much. Thank you for talking to Pitt Street Research. Thanks, Jeff.